I'm not my key users, but maybe I am, <laughs> you know, tech guy in the Northwest that buys ridiculous vehicles. Yeah, so that might be me. This is Grizz PM, PM with the Riz, a little bit of a grizzled beer from experience, bringing you tech product management beyond the frameworks and with a little game. So stick around for industry perspectives on a wide range of topics on bringing better digital products to your customers and what it's really like to work as a product manager in tech. Hit subscribe if you're into it. All right. Hey, Sam. So we're going to talk a little bit about product strategy today. So I talked about strategy in general before with Roger Martin's cascade of strategy questions to know what you're going to be working on, where you're going to play, how you're going to win. But product strategy takes it a little bit closer to the products that we launch and deliver to customers. So one topic there is the idea of avoiding the build trap and delivering features just in a great velocity, but that are maybe not connected to value. So do you have any thoughts on not getting caught in that build trap of just delivering more and more features? It's really about addressing value. Value can happen through features. And I'm coming at this with the bias of a, a UX person who values research and talking with people. And uh, if, if I discover that somebody can't log in or sign up for something easily. It doesn't matter what's behind the wall, make an experience seamless, easy to address. The things that are preventing somebody from doing those MVP things, the things that they, they need to do, make those things more desirable, more delightful, and you know prioritize those things, which can absolutely come in the form of features, but not just features for the sake of features. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard of that uh, ruthless prioritization in some of the articles that I assigned that are really talking about like how do we make sure that list that we want to cover is really tightly connected to the business strategy and what we want to accomplish so that way we're focused on delivering real impact and real value and the reason we have to do that is we have limited time resources and we want to pull that off and deliver impact as soon as possible so we can be successful our companies can be successful and our customers can be successful in doing whatever job they need to accomplish. There's a lot there between strategy and execution, and there's a lot of tension in between those two and a lot of different ways of doing things to connect them and then move towards launches of products. So do you have any thoughts on where research fits in that space? Sometimes that's more upfront towards strategy, and sometimes that's the research we do uh, in the product space where we're connecting with users there and uncovering needs as well. There's uh, an approach called the double diamond that I really like. Think of your one feature, if you will, or a problem as two diamonds. So the first point that you have, it goes out, it diverges. This is you trying to understand everything you can about a problem space. If a user has a certain task that they're doing, understand everything about that task. That might mean talking to users, probably does. Understanding the task, what done looks like, anything tertiary around there, because at the end of the day, the problem that you're trying to solve might not be the root problem and you want to see if you can get past that. So you do all this going out and you diverge and then you converge, you come back and you start synthesizing that information. You see what is interesting, if there's any patterns and what is really meaningful, something that if we address this, this is going to be, you know, a real net positive for your user base. So that's we'll call it diamond number one. You, you've gone out, you've learned a bunch about stuff, then you've identified a real problem, a challenge that you want to address. Then you go back out again, diamond number two, and this is you trying to solve for one of those problems, not necessarily doing research at that point. That's the creative aspect based on the problem that you have now decided that you want to address. And then so you, you went out and you came up with two different solutions, 10 different solutions, but you really, you know, you pick one or two and then you converge again and you test and you, you bring users back into the fold you get to see what's working for them and what's not there's many a time that something that i thought was completely intuitive was not to that user group and it blew my mind and i'll never make that mistake again but i'm sure i will and then when that all works then you you know talk it over with development and assuming that it all works in terms of complexity and whatnot you move forward with that feature nice you mentioned a couple things we can 
uh, dive in there. But I do like that double diamond approach. That's a little bit different than uh, usually I called it that divergent and convergent thinking. But I think everyone's eyes gloss over uh, when I say that, even though uh, it's actually a pretty powerful approach. And we definitely use that a lot when we do design thinking. So I definitely recommend that as a way forward. One thing you mentioned, which we're going to cover in a few weeks as well, but the idea of what are the jobs to be done for a customer, you phrase it a little bit differently, but what are they like hiring us to do, or hiring the product to do as a metaphor and is what we're offering actually a solution to get that done. So there's a lot of fun metaphors for that. There's a great podcast actually just recently from one of the best product management podcasts out there on uh, Lenny Richitsky's podcast, so Lenny's podcast, uh, with one of the founders of Jobs To Be Done. Uh, and we'll cover that more in depth because it's such a great topic. But do you have any thoughts on the user's needs and what they're actually hiring us to do? Whenever I'm hired by a client, I don't think of myself as working for that client. I'm working for the client's client. Um, at the end of the day, that's how they make money. And so I want to help them make money because it's a business. To that end, having to understand things kind of both what is the user trying to do and understanding how it profits the business. I imagine as a project manager, I'm going to come to you with things that are completely delightful and desirable for a user. But at the end of the day, those are never going to win out over something that's going to make more money for the business. That's who's paying us. That's how it's just keeping the lights on to provide a value to the users. There's no better way to get to know who a user base is than by talking with them. Understand their day-to-day -day activities. Let's just say that you're interviewing analysts. You might discover that there's different tiers of analysts. There's those that have been there for six months and there's people that have been there for six years and their level of knowledge can be completely different. And your goal is to get them ramped up to the same level and perform tasks relatively quickly. And you won't know that unless you understand what they're doing. Uh, and inevitably they might be doing the same things, but the ramp up could be different or, you know, there, there could be an expert mode, if you will. Uh, once I know what I'm doing, I like to kick it up a notch doing X, Y, Z. Yeah. Let's choose a fun example. That's like actually more of a consumer product. So, uh, if you were to do this without this concept, so like a one wheel, like the, uh, snowboarding, like floating scooter e vehicle sort of thing, which I have. Like, if you think about it from a user perspective, you could think about it like, oh, it's for transportation. It's to get me from one place to another. And so if that was the job to be done, then you would start building features on maybe having range that would get you from your home to work. It might have efficiency be important or charging speed or those other things. But I would argue that's absolutely not the job that that customer is hiring you to do. I think there's uh, two main things that it probably does for me and, you know, I'm not my key users, but maybe I am, <laughs> you know, tech guy in the Northwest, uh, that buys ridiculous, uh, vehicles. Yeah. So that might be me. But anyway, the two things I think it tries to do are to have sort of a, a fun recreation floating feeling. So you spend your time on the weekend decompressing. I think that's one. And the other thing I think it is makes you look cool on Instagram. And I actually think that's a serious like need that the people are actually trying to cover for. And if you play to that, I think you could actually guide like features. So if you had at the end of the ride, which they kind of have some of these features, they're not as developed, but it'll show your analytics over a picture that you could then quickly post to stories or snap or TikTok that could already integrate into a template that is less work. You might be able to sell more, like maybe you and brand it and says one wheel on it with the watermark or other things uh, like that. Um, but it's really like, you know, what kind of needs are we solving for that maybe aren't obvious and maybe we're focused in the right way, even though there's overlap between those. I don't know if you had any thoughts there. There's definitely some unspoken. Yes. Like I want to be cool, right? I want to share this and I want to share it in a certain way. The prime days of GoPro, you knew that the video you were watching was from GoPro and it's not explicitly, I don't think that it did, had a watermark if it did correct me. It was the format. I mean, honestly, it, all the ways that they advertised it, it is a robust, rugged thing. And you can, you can use it in a way that you wouldn't use a normal camera and its ability to mount and things like that. They played into that with their marketing and they wanted to make sure that this thing could attach to anything. And that, that was a feature that was an important one for them. Yeah. I love that you said that. I forgot about that because there originally was another 
couple different companies in the action sports arena or small personal camera one. Cisco acquired one and then did nothing with it. But there was another one called Contour. And from a hardware perspective, it was this much better looking tube design. So I would think it would have won out on the hardware side, but the jobs to be done for GoPro were the couple we kind of mentioned there. Like one was to look cool and feel connected to the outdoor community and see it more as like, they originally thought it was like a media company and probably spent a lot of money on content that way but just as a media even of one of us in social media versus just seeing it as a hardware piece of work to have high resolution and speed and everything like that gopro was not a pretty product it was not attractive and it had a lot of issues too on the hardware side but they realized that's not why people bought it it was a whole different need to be met i think they also had some strategic partnerships the ability to have product that you could just place a GoPro ready to go was a compelling feature. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe they should integrate my Insta360 with my one wheel so I can look cool in uh, 360. We'll throw that into the video. Kidding. Um, yeah, so one more thing I want to cover before we wrap up is like roadmaps. So sometimes we put that a little bit too in front in strategy as we get excited to have a roadmap and put dates and a timeline. But how do we stay connected with delivering the value that we want to customers and the company instead of just drawing out a roadmap of all of the features. At the end of the day, the roadmap should be derived from your questions, which is why are we doing this? It always goes back to the why. We get to the how, and that's going to be whatever you come up with will get displayed as a roadmap. I come from a more agile background, and I very much believe that uh, iterative development, understanding what comes first is more important than explicitly having a timeline for it. We can estimate how long it takes based on, you know, estimates from design, from development, but it's iterative. You know, I'm putting out this value and as quickly as you can, give it out to the world. Let them, you know, or specifically your user base, see how they interact with it. If it doesn't hit in a way that you expect, ask why and see if you can't tweak it. That should be a priority over whatever your feature number two is, in my opinion. Why would I be building on a flawed product? It's gonna cost a lot more money to fix it later than iteratively in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, a few things going on. There's one, estimations are difficult. There's thousands of pages of books that have covered that since the 70s and F estimating the man hours for completing software and there's a lot of techniques to do that and it's still difficult and we still miss plus the market changes and we also don't know what uh, customers will respond to which is the uncertainty of it so if we're not iteratively replanning that roadmap then we're not going to be connected to value as tightly so yeah that's all i had for today sam so uh thank you very much and uh we will see you next time